Hey guys, welcome to the Forum for Learning and to part one of lecture two. Um, this lecture is going to be all about, or rather part one is going to be all about atoms. So we're going to define sort of, we're going to talk about what are atoms. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, how the atoms are structured. Um, and then we'll go on to talk about the three subatomic particles that are found within the atom. Uh, we'll also discuss uh, what are the atomic numbers, mass numbers, and, at and what's atomic weight. Um, we'll also talk about how protons and neutrons specifically determine the physical characteristics of an element. And we'll also uh, we'll close off by discussing how electrons in particular determine the chemical properties of an element. So without further ado, let's get started. So what are atoms? Well, an atom is essentially the fundamental unit of matter, right? So, well, that's well. The next question would be, well, well, then what's matter, right? So, matter is just anything that takes up space. In other words, it has volume and mass, or and has mass. Right, so matter is just anything that takes up space and has mass. Um, and the sort of the building blocks of matter uh, is the atom, which is again the fundamental unit of matter. So, you know, anything from the phone or computer you're watching this video on to the shirt that you're wearing uh, is matter. And each of those things that we just mentioned are made up of atoms. Okay, so well then, okay, if, if atoms are the fundamental unit of matter, well, let's look at the second question here is, how are the atoms structured? So, let's talk about that. So the atom, actually, you know what, let's move to a different page. So let's go to, all right, so the atom is made up of two main components, right? Two main parts. So the atom is made up of two main parts. Right? So what are they? So number one, it's going to be the nucleus. Okay? So the nucleus of the atom is located at the center of the atom. Okay? And the nucleus is actually really tiny relative to the atom as a whole. Right? In fact, it's something like the nucleus is only one ten thousandth the volume of the entire atom. So what that means is really, 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 really tiny with respect to the rest of the atom, right? Okay, and the other important thing about the nucleus is that so let's put is that the nucleus houses, so it houses the protons and the neutrons. And these guys are two of the three subatomic particles. And so the protons and neutrons are found within the nucleus of the atom. Okay, so the other part of the atom, because remember we said it's made up of two main parts, is just everything outside of the nucleus. Um, there's no real formal name for it, so we'll just kind of call it the periphery, right? As in like the peripheral portion of the atom. Um, and so the periphery is again sort of just the area outside the nucleus of the atom, right? And so it's just the entirety of the atom uh, that is outside of the nucleus. So in this case, the periphery is quite vast, right? It's quite vast and has large volume. Has large volume. Because it's pretty much the rest of the atom. And the nucleus only takes um, about one ten thousandth the volume of the entire atom, right? So it's the periphery is quite vast. And so like the nucleus housing the protons and neutrons, the periphery houses the remaining subatomic particle, and that is the 
electron oops the electron right so that's pretty much sort of the um the atom from a structural perspective right so now that we've introduced the protons the neutrons and the electrons let's look at sort of how they're organized and the characteristics that they possess so what we'll do is we'll sort of go through an overview of the three subatomic particles um, and then we'll discuss them sort of in individual detail okay all right so let's get a table going here okay so let's let's look at sort of the subatomic particles of so the proton the neutron and the electron with respect to where they're located within the nucleus the charges that they possess and sort of the mass that they have right so we'll do an overview first and then we'll talk about each individual one so uh, we just mentioned the location just recently right so we mentioned that for example that the nucleus contains the protons and the neutrons and the periphery contains the electrons right the electrons are located outside the nucleus so the protons obviously the location is the nucleus the neutron is also located in the nucleus the electrons are located in the locations outside of the nucleus they are located outside the nucleus and we just call that area the periphery just for the intent the purposes of this video so we have like one name to kind of refer to okay so with respect to charge the protons have a positive charge with designation positive one okay neutrons by the way they sound right they're going to be neutral in charge so no charge oops so no charge electrons on the other hand like protons have a charge of one but instead of positive one they're going to be negative in nature okay so now with respect to mass protons have a mass of one amu and amu just means so let's define that so amu is just known as the atomic mass unit sometimes referred to and that unit sometimes is going to be referred to as the Dalton okay depending on your professor how they feel uh, about discussing mass so neutrons similar to protons they too have um, a mass of 1 amu uh, and then electrons on the other hand so electrons have mass right just like anything any other sort of form of matter they have mass but electrons the mass of electrons with respect to the mass of protons and neutrons are really tiny similar to over here right so similar to like the volume of the nucleus being super tiny compared to the, the volume of the periphery right so here with respect to electrons what we actually say is that they have negligible mass you still have mass but again with respect to the other two um, with, pro with respect to the mass of protons and neutrons electrons have um, negligible mass okay so this is just kind of an overview of the various subatomic particles um, and so based on what we just talked about there are some uh, kind of important things that we have to note right um, so number one we said that Protons have a charge of positive 1, right? They have a positive charge. Electrons have a charge of minus 1 with a negative charge. So what that means is because they both have sort of a 1 in front, that means that, and then they have obviously plus and minus respectively between a proton and an electron, this means that uh, protons and electrons have charges of the same magnitude but opposite oops opposite in sign so what do you mean by that so the strength of the two of the charges of the proton and the electron are the same right that's designated by the one right because they have, they both have sort of a charge of one that that means to say that they have the same magnitude of charge in other words they have the same strength or this the, the charges that they possess have the same strength right 
but they're opposite in sign. So what that means is that protons, so the, charges the, pro the charge of the proton will cancel out the charge of the electron, right? That's what that means, because the strength of the charges is the same, it's just that they're, they're opposite in sign. So the caveat to this is that in a neutral atom, the number of protons will equal the number of electrons. And again, the reason for this is because the number of protons means the number of positive charges. It has to equal the number of negative charges if the atom overall is to be neutral. Right, because if the number of positive charges equals the number of negative charges, then that would mean they cancel each other out and you have a net neutral charge. Right, so that's an important distinction to make because if an atom is neutral, which sort of most naturally occurring atoms tend to be neutral, um, so if they're going to be, if the atom is neutral, then that means the number of protons has to equal the number of electrons. And the reason for that is because the the protons and electrons have charges of the same magnitude but opposite uh, in sign. Okay, so that's one uh, sort of important thing to note. The other thing is also that, so we mentioned here that the mass of the electron is negligible when compared to the mass of the, the proton and the mass of the neutron, right? So what that means is that, so let's write this down. So when we make calculations regarding, or calculations rather, um, for when we wanted to determine sort of the um, mass of the atom. So, so when, making, when we make calculations for determining the mass of an atom, we don't include electrons. And again, the reason is because that the main contributors of mass uh, with respect to the atom is going to be your protons and your neutrons. And because the electrons are negligible, they don't really, you don't really have to include them uh, in when making calculations uh, for determining the mass of an atom. Okay, because again, the electrons have negligible mass. Okay, so that was another that was another important thing to note. Another thing to note is that the nucleus of an atom is dense and positively charged. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Well, again, the nucleus of the atom, so let's look at the nucleus for a second, right? So we see nucleus, nucleus coming up here, which means that, again, they house the protons and the neutrons. And now if you look at the charge of the nucleus, it's they, you have positive charges and you have um, neutral charge. So overall, the the overall charge of the nucleus is going to be that is going to be positive, right? Because because protons are going to contribute to that positive charge, and the neutrons they don't contribute anything to charge. So overall, the, the nucleus is going to have a positive charge, right? So it's positively charged. So what do we mean by it's that it's dense? Well, density again is a function of mass and volume. Right, so we know that um, the majority of the mass of an atom is located uh, amongst the protons and the neutrons, and these guys are located in the nucleus. So the nucleus is actually uh, contains pretty much the majority of the mass of the atom, right? Because that's what that's where you have protons and neutrons, which are the two subatomic particles that actually contribute to atomic mass or to the mass of the atom, and so the mass is concentrated within the nucleus. And then as you mentioned here, the nucleus is actually very tiny, so we didn't actually, so it's very small, right? And so when you have a large amount of mass in a small amount of volume, you end up with something that is super dense. So, the, so then again, the nucleus of an atom is, is a dense, positively charged 
is is actually is is the dense positively charged core of the atom. Okay, all right. So now let's make one more distinction, and that is that this is actually kind of important. Is that like? Well, let's do it the other way around. So opposite. Charges attract each other, and like charges repel each other. Right. So the so opposite charges again attract each other, uh, and like charges repel each other. So it's like you know how we say opposites attract, right? So the corollary to that is the fact that protons, they attract electrons, right? Because protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged, so the opposites are going to attract each other. And then they're going to repel protons. Again, because positive is going to repel positive because like charges repel each other and when it comes to electrons electrons are going to attract protons right because negative charge is going to attack attract a positive charge because opposite charge opposite charges attract each other and these guys these electrons are going to repel other electrons So that's pretty much sort of an overview. So we'll, we'll look at sort of one more uh, kind of diagram to sort of highlight this, this, uh, well, this overview we just discussed. So let me just bring that up here. Okay, so this is just to kind of show what the atom looks like from a visual perspective, right? So we mentioned that we talked about it over here that, you know, the atom consists of two main parts, the nucleus and the periphery. The nucleus is very small, it's located in the center, and it contains protons and neutrons. The periphery is quite vast, um, and it contains electrons, right? And it's the area outside the nucleus. Okay, so then we talked about sort of where each thing is located, the charges, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is sort of a visual representation of the atom, right? So if you look here, so this right here is the nucleus, right? Those are, that's the, uh, there you go, it's the nucleus, right? I should probably didn't need to write that. So, okay, so that's the nucleus. Nucleus is located in the center. And what do we have in there? We have your protons that are right here, right? So these guys here. And then you have your neutrons, which are, well, actually, let's do a different color so it's better to see. So you have neutrons, which are located right there. And these guys are located within, again, the nucleus, right? And the electrons, as you can see, um, these guys sort of revolve around the nucleus, right? They kind of move about around the nucleus. So this is just a visual representation of what the atom sort of looks like, okay? All right, so now let's talk about, so now that we've discussed sort of the atom, we kind of have to slowly, I mean, discuss a little bit about the elements, right? So what is... Um, an element, right? So an element is just a pure substance that is made up of, <clears throat> excuse me, only one kind of atom. Okay? So so if we look at, say, for example, um, you know, let's, let's look at an example, right? So let's say you have like a a brick of gold, right? So let's actually, I'll just use yellow, about as close as we're going to get to gold. So let's say you have a brick of gold, right? Now this brick of gold, let's say it's pure gold, right? Um, what it's made up of is really tiny, 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 tiny. tiny gold atoms and only gold atoms right 
And so that's what makes up an element. So if, if so an element again is just a pure substance that's made up of only one kind of atom. Right? So sort of the distinction between atom and element is that elements are made up of atoms. Right? So atoms are the building blocks. So so um, this is sort of an atom, right? A tiny gold atom. And this whole thing is considered the gold element. Right? So it's just that it's made up of atoms. So it, and it's only made up of one kind of atom. Right? So that's what um, elements are. So now let's talk about sort of the biologically... So, so, yeah, elements that are biologically prevalent. Oops. Okay, so that's going to be carbon, hydrogen, Oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. These are going to be like sort of the predominantly um, the elements that are predominantly present in biological creatures and biological systems, right? Now, primarily, it's going to be these guys, these four guys right here. So that's going to be the most abundant. A uh, set of elements that are found within biological systems. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, with trace amounts of phosphorus and sulfur, right? So now what's interesting is that if you look at, for example, you know, carbon, right? Carbon has specific properties um, that are unique to carbon, similar to hydrogen, similar to oxygen and, and nitrogen, and so on and so forth. So even gold, right? So all of these elements sort of have their own unique characteristics, whether it be physical or chemical, right? So what causes that those distinctions to exist, right? So what, cause, what causes them to be unique? And that has to do with subatomic particles. So it's, so the physical and chemical properties, oops, of elements are the result of their subatomic particles. And in particular, the number of subatomic particles Oops. In the nucleus of the elements atoms. Right? So it's in particular the number of subatomic particles. So with that being said, let's look at each subatomic particle individually and see how they contribute to the physical and chemical properties of various elements. Okay, so what do we have? So first we have, so let's look at the table again. So, we, so we'll first talk about the protons. So that's number one, okay? So let's look at protons. Okay. So what's so unique about protons, right? So again, let's let's just do a quick overview of what we discussed so far about protons, right? So protons are located in the nucleus. They have a charge of plus one, and they have a mass of one amu or Dalton. Okay, now the sort of, the other big important uh, aspect with respect to protons is that the number, 
of protons in the nucleus of an atom determines its identity. It's identity. That's the key, right? It's the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. It determines the identity of that atom. And when we talk about identity, we mean um, is it made up of what kind of what kind of atom is it, right? So is it an oxygen atom? Is it a you know um, a nitrogen atom, and so on and so forth, right? So in other words, here's elements differ. from one another based on the number of protons in the nucleus of their atoms. So that's that's kind of why protons are so important because it determines the identity and so this, right, so the idea that sort of the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom determines its identity is a premise for what is called the atomic number. Actually, let's write out the whole thing, number. So again, what's the atomic number? It's simply the number of protons found in the nucleus of the atom of an element, right? That's what the atomic number is. It's just the number of protons found in the nucleus of the atom of an element, okay? And this atomic number is unique to each element. In other words, no two elements can have the same atomic number, right? They, two different elements cannot have the same um, atomic number. And the reason is because each element has its own unique atomic number. So the atomic number is also used to organize the periodic table. So let's look at the periodic table real quick, right? Bring this up a little. Okay, so if you look at the periodic table, which is again the periodic table of elements, right? Um, you notice that, for example, it starts off with one and, it, and it's, alpha, it's numerical in ascending order, two, right, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on and so forth. So the, um, the periodic table is actually organized based off of the uh, atomic numbers of elements. Now it's also, it's also it takes into consideration the various properties that these elements have, but one of the main organizational um, features of the periodic table is the atomic number. Okay, and again, that's the number one key thing is that the atomic number is the number of protons found in the nucleus of an atom, but it's also very unique to each element in it, and that that number determines the identity of the of the um, of the element. And the corollary is that two different elements will always have two different atomic numbers because it's the atomic number that identifies that determines the identity of uh, that element. Okay, all right. So that was. Uh, everything to do with the protons. So now let's look at what's next. We're going to talk about neutrons next. So that's going to be number two. Okay, so neutrons. So let's do a quick recap of what we discussed so far with respect to neutrons. Again, these guys are located 
the nucleus. They also have um, have a neutral charge, so no charge. And they have a mass of 1 AMU or Dalton. Okay, so why are neutrons important? Well, neutrons, oops. So neutrons are important when discussing mass number and isotopes. So what is mass number and what are isotopes? So let's discuss mass number first and we'll talk about isotopes. So we can talk about it here. Okay. So mass number, right? Well, actually, let's write. So what's mass number? So mass number is the number of protons and the number of neutrons in the atom of an element, okay? So again, the atomic number is the number of protons in the atom of an element, and the mass number is the number of protons plus neutrons in the atom of an element. So why is mass number important? Well, okay, so let's look at um, Let's look at the table again, right? All right, so we've determined that the main contributors to mass of an atom are gonna be your protons and your neutrons, right? And the other thing is also that your protons and your neutrons have a mass of one AMU each. So the contributors of mass are, the atomic mass are protons and neutrons protons and neutrons, and they each have uh, a mass of one Dalton or one atomic mass unit. So in other, so what that means is the mass number is also the mass of the atom. Because the mass number takes into account the sole contributors of mass in an atom, which are protons and neutrons, and because protons and neutrons each have a mass of one Dalton each, the mass number is also the mass of the atom. Okay? So that's why mass number is important. Now let's talk about isotopes. So what are isotopes? Isotopes are just different forms of the same element and isotopes differ from each other differ from one, one another so differ from one another based or differ from one another because or actually should say by number of neutrons they have So what that means is, so that there's, there's some important things to note, that if they're different forms of the same element, right, what does that mean? That means that isotopes have the same atomic number, right? Because if they're different forms of the same element. Same element would mean that they have the same atomic number because remember the atomic number is unique to each and every element. So that's number one. But if they differ from one another by the number of neutrons, then that means that so they have the same atomic number but different mass number. 
right? Because again, the mass number is the number of protons and the number of neutrons. And if these guys are different from one another by the number of neutrons they have, that means they must have different mass numbers as well. So let's summarize that real quick. So isotopes have same number of protons but different number of neutrons which means it looks like some other reasons oops which means that they have the same atomic number but different mass number that's the key right here with respect to isotopes right it's that they have the same atomic number but different mass number they have the same number of protons in the nucleus of their atoms but they have different number of neutrons in the nucleus of, of their atoms so let's look at sort of an example okay so let's look at an example to kind of drive this point home all right so the one of the more commonly occurring um, isotopes of carbon is carbon 12 carbon 13 and carbon 14 okay so let's look at let's look at each of them and see how many protons and how many neutrons they have so first of all if they're all carbon that means again that they have the same atomic number. So let's look at what the atomic number of carbon is. The atomic number of carbon is six. And why is it six? Because it has six protons in the nucleus, right? So the, these guys all have six protons, six protons, and six protons, right? Well, okay, these, these numbers here, 12, 13, and 14 represent the mass number which again is the number of protons and the number of neutrons. So I should say plus actually here, plus the number of neutrons, right? So if we know the mass number, which is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, we know the number of protons, the, the atomic number, we can calculate how many neutrons it has, right? So this one, so what number plus six equals 12? We're gonna have seven neutrons here, eight, oops, not seven, six. We have seven neutrons here. And we have eight neutrons here. So as you can see, these guys are isotopes because again, same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. Right, so that's what isotopes are. Isotopes are just atoms that have different number of neutrons but same number of protons. Okay? So and then obviously the corollary being the same atomic number but different mass number. Okay? So that's those are just good examples of um of isotopes, a good example of a commonly occurring isotope. Now, generally speaking, most naturally occurring isotopes are stable generally speaking but there are some that aren't and these guys are called radioisotopes and the reason they're called radioisotopes is because radioisotopes are isotopes that undergo radioactive oops, decay right so what's radioactive decay so radioactive decay is the process by which radioisotopes right so Or I should just say, yeah, radio, 
radioisotopes spontaneously emit radiation or energy in this case in the form of alpha beta so let's do oops alpha beta and gamma radiation so that's pretty much what radioactive decay is again it's the process by which the nucleus of a radioisotope spontaneously emits energy in the form of alpha beta gamma radiation uh, and again, not all isotopes undergo this process, right? So it's just radio, radioactive, or excuse me, radioisotopes, which are again, um, unstable isotopes that undergo radioactive decay, um, are actually unstable. Okay, now something, to, something that's important to note is that during, these process, during the process of radioactive decay, right? So during the process, A nucleus might eject a neutron or proton. Now if it ejects a proton, that means that the atomic number changes, right? Because if you if you lose a proton, you're the number of protons in the, in the nucleus goes down by one. If you lose two, it goes down by two. If you lose three and so on, it goes down by three and so on and so forth. So if you lose or the nucleus ejects a proton, that means that the number of protons in the nucleus goes down by the number of protons that are being ejected, which means the atomic number is gonna change and it's gonna go down by the number of protons being ejected, which ultimately means that now you have a new element or that the element or that the isotope changes to a new element, right? Because again, now it has a different atomic number, which means it's going to be a different element. So that's something important to note because, you know, you might have uh, a question where it asks that in your, in your lecture course. Okay, so now before we finish off with talking about neutrons, let's talk about atomic weight. So let's do a quick recap first. So we talked about atomic number. Again, atomic number being the number of protons found in the nucleus of an atom, right, of a particular element. We talked about mass number, which is the number of protons and the number of neutrons, right? Now we talk about atomic weight. So what is atomic weight? Well, it's a weighted average of all the naturally occurring isotopes of an element in their normally occurring proportions. So in other words, the atomic weight of an element is equivalent to taking the average of all of the mass numbers of all of the atoms present in a representative sample of the element. So let's look at the example up above about gold, right? So if you, okay, so you saw how there's, you know, so many different gold atoms found within this bar of gold, right? So let's say that you, you know, you take a bar of gold that's, coming from Earth, and it's it, it has all of the naturally occurring um, isotopes of, the, of gold, right, uh, in their normally occurring proportions within this bar of gold, and we take the mass number of each and every single atom that's here, right? So if you take the mass number of this atom, that atom, and so on and so forth, then you average that together from a sample that is uh, representative, right, of all of the possible isotopes 
that occur in nature for that element that's your that's your atomic weight so it's it's the it's 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 like taking the it's equivalent to taking the average of all of the mass numbers of all of the atoms right all of the atoms uh, in a representative sample um, of that element so that's what atomic weight is so if you look at uh, so let's look at some where's the periodic table so if you look at the periodic the periodic table particularly this part of the periodic table we see how um, the elements are represented in uh, the periodic table right so we mentioned that number one is the atomic number over there and again we mentioned that you know that majority or all the atoms in uh, represented in the periodic table are organized based on their atomic number so the first number on top is your atomic number atomic number and so on and so forth right all of these are the atomic numbers of the respective elements uh, now down below that you have the atomic symbol right um, and then below that you have your atomic mass or atomic let me just take this out atomic weight right they're kind of interchangeable uh, and then you have the name of the element, the elemental name. So that's sort of one way to um, sort of depict uh, an element. Now, I have to make a couple of distinctions here. Number one is that atomic mass and atomic weight can be used interchangeably. And atomic mass, um, when we talk about atomic mass, that's different from the mass of the atom. Um, and so here's here's a good example as to why, right? So if you look at the atomic mass or atomic weight, which again, they kind of are interchangeable. Atomic mass, atomic weight of uh, all of these elements on this periodic table, for the most part, they're going to have some sort of decimal number, right? If you see some sort of decimal number, you can um, infer that uh, it's 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 referring to the atomic weight or the atomic mass. And the reason is because in order for you to have a decimal, it would mean that it has to be the average right atomic weight the average mass of the average atom of a given element so for example let's say you know um, let's go back to carbon for example right so we talked about where, where was it so we talked about carbon 12 carbon 13 carbon 14 right so so let's so okay so let me just write that over here right so you have carbon uh, 12 okay carbon 12 uh, and then you have so let's write that carbon 13 and carbon 14 right so you have so let's say that you know you have so these are like sort of the uh naturally occurring isotopes the more the abundant naturally occurring isotopes of carbon right so if i take let's say a representative sample of carbon right you're gonna have you're gonna have all these carbon atoms right some of those carbon atoms are going to be carbon 12 some of those carbon atoms are going to be carbon 13. Some of those carbon atoms are going to be carbon 14, right? But what's going to happen is, so this is a distinction between the mass of an atom versus atomic mass or atomic weight, right? So let's say that, you know, um, let's say I pick this, this atom here, right? This one right here. And let's say that's a carbon uh, 14 atom, right? What's the what's the mass of that atom? The mass of that atom is just a mass number, right? And this is the mass number, so the mass of that atom is just 14 AMU or Dalton, right? Um, and then let's say that you know I pick this one, and let's say that's that that's a carbon 13 atom. So if that's carbon 13, then we know that um, that atom, the mass of that atom, is going to be 13 AMU or 13 Dalton. So that's um, the mass of the atom were the mass number right as we mentioned before um, when we discussed uh, mass number that uh, the mass number is also the mass of the atom but that's different from atomic weight and atomic mass uh, and the reason for that is because where's the periodic table just lost the periodic table yep there we go um, atomic mass and atomic weight is that we take the mass of this, we take the mass of this, we take the mass of this, 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 and all of these different carbon atoms, and we average that mass together. And when you get an, when you take an average of you know of millions of atoms in a representative sample, um, 
you're going to end up with some sort of decimal point, right? So that's the distinction, is that the mass of the atom applies to a specific individual atom of an element, right? And that's based off the mass number. That's essentially the mass number. Now, atomic weight, on the other hand, is the weighted average of all of the naturally occurring isotopes in their normally occurring proportions. And it's equivalent to taking the average, the average of all the mass numbers of all these atoms uh, present in a representative sample of carbon. Right? So that's the distinction between atomic mass slash atomic weight and the mass of the atom slash um, mass number. Okay, so it's, 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 it's an individual specific atom versus, generally speaking, how much is the average carbon atom, say for example, what's the mass of the average carbon atom, right? So that's the difference between um, mass number uh, and mass of atom versus atomic mass, atomic weight. Now you'll see, sometimes you'll see atomic mass referring to the mass of the atom, because it makes sense, right, atomic mass, but usually if you see a decimal point, you can rest assured or you can infer uh, comfortably that it's discussing atomic weight, it's that it's, it's, it's discussing that weighted average, okay? Now, um, we discussed a sort of periodic table notation where we have the atomic number on top and then the atomic mass or atomic weight on the bottom, right? Whereas over here, in this example, in these examples here, the way we've uh, depicted them is in what is what's called uh, nuclear notation. Um, and so you might see that as well. And in this case, this number right there is the atomic number, right, is the atomic number. And this number right here is the mass number. So it's kind of flipped in a way, right? Because here you have the atomic number on top, over here you have the atomic number on the bottom right. Um, uh, and you have the mass number on the top left, and here you have the mass number or the atomic weight on the bottom. Uh, another distinction is that, again, when you're talking about mass number, right, it's always going to be a whole number because it's uh, the uh, mass number of a particular atom, and that particular atom is going to have a whole number of protons and a whole number of neutrons, right? It's not going to be, you're not going to have half a proton or half a neutron in an atom, right? You're going to have uh, a whole integer that represents a number of protons, a whole integer that represents a number of neutrons. And again, because the mass of the atom is the mass number, and the mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, uh, the mass of an atom, or the uh, mass number, is always going to be a whole number, right? Because you're going to have whole protons and whole neutrons. Whereas here, again, with respect to atomic mass, atomic weight, um, you're going to have some sort of decimal point because, again, it's the weighted average of all the naturally occurring isotopes in their normally occurring pro proportions. Uh, and it's equivalent to taking the average of all of the mass numbers of, um, of all the atoms pre present in a representative sample of that element. So you can kind of think about sort of mass of the atom, and then when you're talking about atomic weight, it's the weighted average, right? Atomic weight, weighted average, um, and then mass of atom, mass of atom, right? So, okay. So we discussed nuclear notation, we discussed, um, kind of went over again um, what atomic weight is and the distinction between atomic weight and atomic uh, mass and atomic, uh, I'm sorry, and mass of atom and mass number, okay? All right, so now let's get to um, what's next. Let's talk, let's see what we've talked about thus far. Um, so we covered what are atoms, we covered how are atoms structured? We covered the three subatomic particles. We just discussed atomic mass, or excuse me, atomic number, mass number, and atomic weight. We discussed how protons uh, and neutrons determine the physical characteristics, and by physical, we primarily are discussing uh, mass, right, uh, with respect to protons and neutrons anyway. Uh, and then now we're going to get to electrons and how they determine the chemical properties of an element. So let's get to electrons. Okay, so electrons, right? So electrons, oops, let me rewrite this. Okay, so electrons, like we mentioned earlier, are located outside the nucleus, right? And we like term this the periphery, right? Again, this is just for the purposes periphery of this video.
I don't know how your professors will sort of come up with what name to describe this, but again, just know that electrons are located outside the nucleus uh, of the atom, right? Now, with respect to charge, electrons have, so have a charge of minus one, right? So, uh, in other words, they have the, uh, they have a charge that is the same magnitude but opposite in sign to the charge of that of a proton, right? That's why the number of protons usually equal the number of electrons because they cancel each other out because the magnitude is the same um, but their charges are opposite. So they have a so electrons have a charge of minus one. Now with respect to mass, they have negligible mass uh, when compared to say protons and neutrons, right? Okay, so uh, the importance of electrons come into play uh, with the fact, knowing the fact that it's the electrons that affect the chemical properties of an element. And what do we mean by chemical properties? That we're just simply talking about the fact that electrons dictate, or the number of electrons that are found within an atom of an element, that di dictates how um, that specific atom will interact or react with other atoms and elements. Okay, so it's so electrons determine sort of the chemical properties of an element. So we mentioned that electrons are located um, outside the nucleus, right? Um, and we me also mentioned that this area, this region uh, that we dubbed the periphery, the region outside the nucleus, is quite vast, right? It's it has a lot of volume and it's quite vast and it's a lot of empty space um, as compared to the nucleus. So if you if electrons are located in this you know really large uh, empty space, there has to be some sort of way in which they're organized, right? So electrons are organized, so electrons are organized into orbitals and energy shells. So that's sort of how they're organized within the periphery, within the region outside the nucleus of the atom, right? So let's talk about orbitals. So what are orbitals? So orbitals are just a region of space within the atom um, outside the nucleus uh, where an electron is found about 90% of the time. So again, it's, the re it's a region of space in the periphery where an electron is found 90% of the time. Okay, now there are different types of orbitals that exist uh, with, res with respect to different shapes and different orientations, but regardless of the type of orbital, a single orbital can only contain up to two electrons max. Meaning, so let's write that. So a single orbital, regardless of the type, can only contain two electrons max. And well, why is that, right? So let's let's remember we mentioned earlier in this in this lecture that um, earlier in this video that like charges repel each other and opposite charges attract each other, right? So electrons, again, are going to have the negative charge. So two electrons, they contain like charges, are going to have some sort of repulsive force, right? Now, if you add a third electron, a fourth electron, fifth electron, sixth electron, you can have tremendous repulsive forces. And that's going to cause uh, them not to want to be close to each other. So up to two electrons can be housed within a single orbital but any more and the repulsive forces get too big to where uh, you know they can they can um, you can't have more than two electrons pretty much okay so so yeah so a single orbital can only contain two electrons maximum right now that gives rise to certain issues and the fact that because of the two electron limitation atoms with more than two electrons are going to need to have more than one orbital right to accommodate the additional electrons
And so that's what gives rise to energy shells. So this two, this two electron limitation um, uh, for orbitals gives rise to energy shells because again, atoms are, of elements that have more than two electrons are gonna have to have more than one orbital, right? To house all the electrons. So you have energy shells. So let's talk about energy shells. Okay, so hang on one second. Okay, so let's talk about energy shells. So the first energy shell, okay, so the first shell uh, is going to contain up to the first two electrons of an atom. Okay, so it can contain up to the first two electrons of an atom. Okay? Now, the electrons, the, these two, these these two electrons are going to be housed within a single orbital uh, within what's called the S subshell. Okay, so you have an energy shell. So the first sub, first shell is going to also, so it's going to have an S subshell, and within, so within the S subshell you're going to have so there is what's called an s orbital and this s orbital is what's going to house these two electrons here right so so you have a shell so the first shell has a subshell called the s subshell the s subshell contains an orbital called the s orbital and it's within this s orbital that these two electrons are going to be housed and this s orbital has a is spherical in shape, right? So the s orbital is it has a spherical shape. Now, something that's important to note about the first shell is that the first shell is the closest to the nucleus. So closest energy shell to the nucleus, and that brings about an important property. The closer, so remember we mentioned that the reason that uh, an, an orbital can only contain two electrons maximum is because of the repulsive forces, right? They get too much when you add third or fourth and so on electrons. So they, up to two, it's you still have some repulsive forces, but it's manageable. Now, that's with respect to like charges repelling each other, right? But remember we said that also the opposite, in other words, opposite charges attract each other, right? So because the elect electrons are negatively charged, protons are positively charged, protons are found within the nucleus of the atom and electrons in the first shell are going to be close or they're going to be the closest electrons to the nucleus there's going to be an inherent stability because those those attractive forces between the nucleus and or the protons and the, in the nucleus and the electrons in the first shell are going to allow for greater stability so in this case it's this this shell um, so so again it's the first shell is the closest energy shell to the nucleus and because of the proximity to the nucleus, the negative electrons are greatly stabilized by the positive protons in the nucleus. And so because of this, so it's the closest to the nucleus, and because of this, this shell has the least energy and is the most stable. So uh, it has the least energy and is the most stable. Okay, so it's because of the fact that opposite charges repel. These guys are going to be the closest to the opposite positive charge of the protons in the nucleus. And so there's going to be attractive forces that are going to help stabilize uh, these electrons and give them the least amount of energy because there's not those repulsive forces are not um, are going to be mitigated by the attractive forces of, of the nucleus. Okay, so now the second shell. So this can contain up to an additional, or up to eight additional electrons. So now how are these uh, electrons organized, right? So in this shell, you're gonna have, you're gonna have an S subshell, 
similar to the first shell and what's called a P subshell. Okay, so this S subshell is going to contain an S orbital similar to the first shell. So single, so that's one single S orbital. The P subshell is going to contain three P orbitals. So you have one S orbital, three P orbitals for a total of four orbitals. And because each orbital can contain up to two electrons, so times two electrons, you can have up to eight additional electrons found within the second shell um, of electrons, right? So, uh, so yeah, so that's that's the second shell. Now, the second shell is also found in all elements that, that have more than two electrons. So that's another thing important to say. So second shell is found within all elements, oops, not electrons, all elements that have more than two electrons, okay? Because uh, if it only has two electrons, then it only needs the first shell, right? Because the first shell can house up to the first two electrons. But if you have more than two electrons, you're going to need a second shell to organize or to hold uh, the additional electrons. Okay, so now elements say that have more than eight plus two, ten electrons are going to have additional shells. Now these additional shells are, can can also have the, so they're going to have your s orbital. They're going to have p orbitals, and they're also going to have what are called d orbitals and f orbitals. Now you guys don't have to really worry about additional shells, at least for the purpose of this lecture series, and most likely for your biology 101 course, because um, because the biologically relevant elements that we mentioned earlier, so hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, um, phosphorus, nitrogen, and sulfur, are going to only contain up to three energy shells with uh, either S or P subshells. So you're not really going to have to deal with D uh, orbitals and F orbitals, just simply S and P orbitals. Okay, so now, okay, yeah, I just wanted to say something else, that additional shells, so, um, so these additional shells are going to be found within uh, elements that have more than 10 electrons. Okay, so, but yeah, with respect to the biologically relevant elements um, that we mentioned earlier, again, being uh, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, um, we're only really going to contain up. They're only going to uh, contain up to three energy shells with either s or p orbitals. So we're only going to be dealing with the first two subshells, uh, or the first two shells. Excuse me. Okay. All right. So we have to mention another thing. Is that so? Something another thing that's important to note is that within an energy shell. The S subshell will fill with electrons before the P subshell. Okay, so again, within an energy shell, electrons will fill up the orbitals in the S subshell before filling up the orbitals in the P subshell. And this is because the S subshell is lower in energy and more stable than the P subshell. And why is that? So let's first write that. So this is because the S subshell is lower in energy slash more stable than the P subshell. And why is that? That's because the S subshell is located closer to the nucleus than the P subshell. So similar to how the first shell of electrons is going to be more stable than the second and the third because it's the closest to the nucleus, 
within an energy shell, so let's say within the second energy shell that contains both S and P subshells, the S subshell is going to be lower because the S subshell is actually going to be closer to the nucleus than the P subshell. Okay, so that because of that, uh, the S subshell will fill first with electrons before the P subshell will. Okay, that's an important distinction. So this is also, again, we just keep mentioning similar ideas in that the further an electron is from the nucleus of an atom, the higher energy that it has, and thus the less stable it will be. Okay, this is again because it's further from the nucleus is stabilizing charge. So I gotta so we gotta note that. So the further an electron is from the nucleus, or the nucleus the stabilizing positive charge, the more energy it possesses, it will, and the less, or sorry, the, yeah, the less stable it will be. Okay, so the further an electron is from the nucleus stabilizing charge, po stabilizing positive charge, the more energy um, it will possess and the less stable it will be. Okay, now the corollary or the opposite, excuse me, the opposite to that is that the closer an electron is to the uh, nucleus, nucleus is stabilizing positive charge, the less energy it will possess and the more stable it will be, which is what we mentioned with respect to the first shell is going to be the most stable and have the least energy than the second and third and any other shell, right? And again, the fact that the S subshell is going to be is ha is going to have um, less energy and going to be more stable than the P subshell again because of the proximity to the nucleus. Okay, so this this idea that the further an electron is from the nucleus, the more energy it'll have and less stable it'll be, gives rise to what is called the valence shell. Or actually, you know what? Yeah. So before we talk, so it's going to give rise to the val valence shell. Now, valence shell is the outermost shell of electrons in an atom. Now, before we get to talking about the valence shell, I kind of want to go over what we just discussed with respect to orbitals, shells, um, and uh, subshells, and all of that, and give you guys a visual representation of what we just talked about. So let's look at some figures to kind of better understand what we just discussed. So let's talk about, let's do this one first. Okay, so this is a depiction of a hydrogen atom, right? So hydrogen atom is, so if you look at periodic table, hydrogen is the first element, so that it has an atomic number of one, which means what? It has one proton. If it has one proton, it also means it has one electron. And if it only has a single electron, um, it's gonna only contain the first shell, right? Because the first shell could contain up to the first two electrons. So if an atom only has one electron, it's gonna be found within that first shell. So this is just a depiction of what's called the Bohr model, um, and it shows you the different shells. So the, the 1n, the 2n, and the 3n just represent the first energy shell, second energy shell, and third energy shell. Now because hydrogen only has one electron, and the first energy shell can contain up to the first two electrons, hydrogen is only going to have one shell, right, or one um, shell of electrons. And that's going to be the first shell. So that's why we have one electron here, and it's, it's going around in the first subshell or excuse me, the first shell, energy shell, okay? So this is, just an, this is just a depiction of the Bohr model and what we mean when we talk about energy shells. So now let's look at another diagram here. Uh, and let's look at, yeah, let's look at, uh, we'll, look at, we'll look at this right here. Okay, so let's look at this. So here's a, here's a good example of what we mean by, or the distinction between shells, subshells, and orbitals. So a shell is is what we're talking about over here. So we have the first shell, the second shell, third shell, right? Remember, we mentioned the first shell is only going to have one subshell, the S subshell, and that S subshell is going to contain one orbital, the S orbital. So let's look at um, let's look at the second shell. So let me just talk about the second shell real quick. The second shell is going to have two subshells, an S subshell and a P subshell. Which, it is, which are going to contain one s orbital and three p orbitals respectively, so for a total of four orbitals, right? So that's so let's look at that visually. So here's a, a good example of the second shell. So we're talking about this this second shell right here, okay? So we have the shell contains both subshells and all the orbitals, okay? So now within the shell we have two subshells. 
one is called this is going to be the s sub subshell and this is going to be called the p subshell now within the s subshell you have a single s orbital here right so that's the, that's an s orbital so this is a s orbital now within the p subshell which is these guys right here you're going to have one two three three p orbitals okay so for a total of four orbitals uh, which means in again because you can have two electrons maximum per orbital that's going to give us eight it's going to give us the ability to add eight additional electrons to the second shell or the fact that eight additional electrons can be housed within the second shell okay so hopefully that gives you guys a visual representation of what we mean by uh, the shell the energy shell uh, the energy shell, the subshell, and the orbital. Okay? Alright, so now let's look at one more diagram to talk about proximity. Okay, so let's look at this guy right here. Alright, so here we have same thing, same organization, same structure, same uh, sort of depiction of three dimensional depiction of the orbital. So let's look at this real quick. So we have 1n subshell, which means that it's the it's a subshell within the first shell, right? And it's an s subshell, um, and that's this this thing in blue right here. Okay. Now outside of that blue, we're gonna have the second uh, subshells. So this is the, the subshell is the second sh energy shell. So we have the s subshell that's within the second energy shell, and we have the p subshell within the second energy shell. So let's look at the s the s subshell first. Now s subshell is going to contain your s orbital. The s orbital is located in this in this red uh, sphere, okay, in the red sphere. And then you have outside of that the three p orbitals within the uh, p subshell, and that's located here. So we have one p orbital here, we have another p orbital here, and we have another p orbital here. Okay, and again, the p orbitals are dumbbell shaped, whereas the s orbitals are spherical, are, are spherical in shape. Now, here's why we, remember we mentioned that the s orbital fills up, before, or the s subshell rather, fills up before the p subshell, right? And the reason for that is because of proximity. So if you look at, let's look at the, the, second, um, the second energy shell. So we're looking at these guys here and these guys here, right? We're, we're not gonna, we're gonna ignore that. So the s subshell, which is this right here, Right, containing the s orbital, is closer to the nucleus than the p orbitals, which are these guys here. So if you look at an electron here, electron can be found here, electron can be found here, whatever. The distance between this and the center of the of of the uh, of the atom, the nucleus, is is more than the distance from here to here. So this is closer to the nucleus, which is why it's more stable, has less energy. So electrons are going to want to be are going to prefer the S subshell over the P subshell in a given energy shell, right? That's why the S subshell will fill up first before the P subshell will fill up. So hopefully that gives you guys a visual representation of what we just talked about so far with respect to energy shells, um, subshells, and orbitals. So now let's continue our talk with respect to uh, the valence shell. So we mentioned before that the further away an atom is, or excuse me, the further away an electron is, from the nucleus of the atom, from the center of the atom, the higher the, the energy that it possesses and the, le the less stable it will be, right? So the valence shell is the outer most shell of electrons in an atom, okay? So yes, yeah, so the, the, the valence shell is the outermost, elect, outermost shell of electrons in an atom, right? Now the importance of the valence shell comes in the fact that it determines an act, atom's reactivity. So it's the valence shell that determines an atom's reactivity. And in particular, it's the number of electrons uh, in the atom's valence shell that determines its stability. Okay, so why is it the number of 
uh, of atoms, right? Oh, sorry, number of electrons um, that deter in the valence shell that, ter that determines reactivity. Well, it's that has to do with what's called the octet rule. The octet rule is just discusses the 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 tendency of of atoms to form stable associations with other atoms in order to completely fill their valence shell. Okay, so valence shell or the outermost shell, right? And in order to so in order to to, to completely fill the valence shell, most atoms need eight electrons. Okay, so again. It's the valence shell that is the outermost shell of electrons in an atom, and it's the valence shell deter that determines uh, an atom's uh, stability and reactivity. Okay, why is that? It has to do with the octet rule. The octet rule states that there's a natural tendency of atoms to form stable associations with other atoms in order to completely fill their outermost energy shell or the valence shell. Now, in order to completely fill that valence shell, most atoms need about eight electrons. And why is it eight electrons? This is because the valence shell of most atoms only contains s and p subshells for a total of four orbitals, right? Because the s subshell contains a single s orbital, p subshell contains uh, three p orbitals, so you have a total of four orbitals, which means they can house up to eight electrons. Hence why, uh, to completely fill the valence shell, most atoms need eight electrons. Now, there are exceptions to the octet rule, right? And it's called the octet rule because of the fact that most atoms need eight electrons, right? Like octagon, right? Um, it's eight electrons, hence the name octet rule. Now there are exceptions, right? So one of the more pre predominantly uh, important ones, at least with respect to uh, the biological, um, biologically relevant elements is hydrogen. So if we looked at hydrogen up here, so wait, let me just write down. So exceptions, do exist. Um, and, and then the example we're going to give is hydrogen. Okay, so let's look at hydrogen over here. So we mentioned that hydrogen has an atomic number of one, which means that it has one proton in its, in its, in its uh, nucleus. And because it has one proton, it also means that a neutral hydrogen atom is going to have an addition, an, a, 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 it's going to have an electron as well. So it only has one electron, right? So if it only has one electron, it's housed within the first energy shell. Remember, we mentioned that the first energy shell can only contain up to the first two electrons. So the valence shell of a hydrogen atom is the first shell, right? Because it only has one shell. So that is the last and outermost shell. So in order to fill that valence shell, which is the first shell, it needs to have two electrons. Right, because the first energy shell can only house a maximum of two electrons. So to completely fill the first shell, you need to have two electrons. Now hydrogen already has one, so it just needs one additional electron to um, fill its valence shell. So it doesn't need eight, right? It, it can only hold up to two. So that's the distinction because hydrogen is is unique in the sense that it only has one electron. It only has one uh, energy shell, um, and which is the valence shell. And in order to fill that. Um, you need one additional electron for a total of two electrons versus eight electrons. Okay, so that's that's a an, an important uh, exception to the rule. Now, now let's talk about what happens when uh, when an, an an atom has its uh, valence shell completely filled. So, so when the valence shell of an atom is completely filled, right? When it's completely filled uh, and it contains no unpaired electrons, that means that it's stable. And that stability 
makes the atom unreactive. So when the valence shell of an atom is completely filled, it is stable. And this stability makes the atom unreactive or yeah, unreactive. Okay, so let's look at an example, right? So if you look at, uh, where is the periodic table? If we look at group the group 18 um, elements here on the periodic table, so the last sort of column of elements, these are called the noble gases. And the reason they're called the noble gases is because they're unreactive. And they're unreactive because their valence shells are completely filled. Um, and they have eight electrons in their valence shell, which so the, which means that they satisfy the octet rule. And because their valence shells are completely full, they're stable, and that stability confers them uh, the fact that confers the fact that they are unreactive. So that's where they're called the noble gases. So that's an example of elements of, of elements that have completely filled uh, valence shells. So now let's talk about. So we talked about what happens um, when. So we talked about. The valence shell, we talked about the octet rule, the exceptions to the octet rule. Uh, we talked about what happens when the octet rule is um, fulfilled, right, is satisfied, and with respect to the noble gases. Um, in other words, what happens when the valence shell is completely filled. Um, and now we have to talk about what happens when, when it, the octet rule isn't met, right, and it's not one of those exceptions. What happens when the valence shell is not complete? So when a valence shell is not com is not filled completely so when a when the valence shell isn't completely filled isn't completely filled it has unpaired electrons which makes it unstable so when the valence shell isn't completely filled the atom is unstable, right? And this instability is going to cause these this, the atom to want to react and bond with another atom such that it's able to fill the valence shell and gain stability. So, okay, so this instability is going to motivate the atom to react or bond with other atoms such that it can completely fill its valence shell and become stable okay so once again when an, when a valence shell isn't completely filled it has unpaired electrons which inherently makes it unstable and this instability then causes the atom to want to go out and react or bond with other with another atom such that it's able to fill its valence shell and thus gain stability and this process of you know of acquiring stability uh, is done through bonding right so this is where we have, and this process uh, is done uh, by either, so bonding is either sharing of electrons between atoms, or the gaining slash losing of of electrons between atoms. In other words, a transfer of electrons between atoms. And this is going to set us up for um, part two of lecture two, where we're going to talk about reactions um, and bonding. I hope you guys learned something. Um, and let's just kind of make sure we've touched all the points that we're supposed to touch.
Um, so we talked about what atoms are, the fundamental unit of matter, and we talked about how atoms are structured, where right? we have the nucleus, um, and we have the periphery, and how they're organized. Um, what are the three subatomic particles? We talked about protons, neutrons, and electrons. We talked about atomic number, mass number, and atomic weight. We talked about how protons and neutrons determine the physical, so let me just, how protons and neutrons determine the uh, physical characteristics of an element, specifically mass, right? Uh, and then we also talked about how electrons determine the chemical properties of an element just now with respect to the valence shell the, and all of that, right? So that's it for, for uh, part one of lecture two. So again, like I said, in, in part two of lecture two, we're going to start talking about bonding um, and reactions. Um, and that's it. So I hope you guys learned something. Um, oh, and all of the, I just wanted to kind of um, clarify that all of the images and diagrams used in this video uh, came from the um, biology textbook from OpenStax, uh, from the OpenStax website. Um, and so if you guys want to access that, I'll drop a link in the description below. Um, and I'll also um, drop a link to sort of any other resources um, down in the description below as well. So as always, uh, stay true, be kind, never stop learning. Um, and that's it for this one. So, as usual, okay, bye.